This is the Weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmoth. Good morning, I'm Justin Warmoth. We're just one day away from a critical test flight of NASA's new moon rocket. It is the first major step for the space agency's Artemis program that aims to one day return astronauts to the lunar surface. This morning, Ken Kramer with Space Up Close is here with a preview of the uncrewed mission and the pressure NASA faces to make sure things go smoothly. Well, I'm extremely excited. I've been following this program for about 15 years since it was first born under Project Constellation. Now it's Project Artemis, it got renamed. And it also got the mission to land people on the moon. The first woman and the first person of color announced by President Biden. So that's real exciting. And we'll have a test flight coming up on Artemis One. I think you guys are gonna be uh, covering that. And, um, and then after that, we will have a crew flight on Artemis II with four astronauts, including the first Canadian, the first non-American to go beyond uh, Earth orbit. And then Artemis III, launching around 2025, 2026, will actually land those people on the moon. Um, using the Orion capsule and the SLS rocket, two of them will orbit and two of them will go down to the moon. That Those crews are yet to be announced. So yeah, it's real exciting because, you know, when I was a kid, we were going to the moon. We actually landed on the moon when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. And then, unfortunately, Project Apollo ended. The last three moon missions were canceled very short-sightedly. And, uh, but now it's resurrected. And so, yeah, we're all extremely excited. I do want to talk about that uh, since you brought it up. You know, it's been about 50 years, some 50 years uh, since NASA has been back to the moon. And, and I'm, I'm curious, other than like budgetary issues, what was the reason behind that? The reason is budgetary and politics. Mm. It didn't have enough political support. President Nixon actually canceled the last three Apollo moon landings, 18, 19, and 20, in the early 1970s. Uh, technically, we accomplished everything. NASA did accomplish everything. So there was no technical reason to, to do it. It was just at that time, there was the Vietnam War, and there was a lot of strife in the country, kind of like today. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and so it didn't have enough political support. Today, there does seem to be more political support and the public seems to be behind it. Um, and so hopefully it will continue, but there have been a few false starts. In the meantime, uh, President Bush, um, first one, announced a return to the moon back in the 1980s, but it again didn't get enough political and budgetary support. And it happened again with uh, Bush two, Constellation was canceled. And now, uh, luckily, under President Obama and then continuing through to President Biden now, it seems to be a real interest. So real exciting. You know, I'm the Apollo generation. You and many of your viewers are the Artemis generation. Absolutely. And so we really hope that this continues. I'm a scientist, so I'm real excited from, you know, an exploration point of view as well as a scientific point of view. There's lots of great science that we can do and we need to get off this planet mm -hmm. and exploring the cosmos. And so I'm real excited about that. As you look at Artemis and then you look back on Apollo, what are some of the, the similarities there and what are the, the key differences in those two projects? Um, well, when it was Apollo, we didn't even know if we could land on the moon. You know, that started with President Kennedy in the early 1960s and we barely launched Alan Shepard on a suborbital flight. And then President Kennedy announced this fantastic goal of landing a man on the moon before the decade was out. I mean, it's unbelievable. Before we had computers, before there was widespread television, you know, and you, I look back on it and it, it's hard to believe it even happened. Um, with social media today, you know, there's so, so much uh, strife and backbiting and criticisms all the time. If that existed back then, I don't know if we would have gone to the moon. But anyway, the resolve was there. President Kennedy got the nation behind it. And um, and so it was full speed ahead. The Vietnam War intervened and then the sport dropped a little bit. You know, luckily, we don't have a war going on right now. Uh, there was, as you know, Iraq and Afghanistan in the, in, in the recent past, but that's over with now. Mm -hmm. um, so so the difference is now we're going back those were brief missions, okay? A few days landing on the surface of the moon. Now we want to go back and we want to go back to stay. And so this Artemis mission, whenever it does launch in a few years, Artemis 3, they will land on the moon for at least a week instead of three days. And then we want to build a sustainable presence. And so 
they're going to the south pole of the moon. And why are we going to the south pole? Because that's where the water ice is. There's permanently shadowed craters. So we can live off the land, which we couldn't do on Apollo because that went equatorial where there is no ice. Mm -hmm. So they can go land on the moon and mine that ice potentially. And then we have rocket fuel and we have air and we have water. So we can live off the moon to a certain extent and not have to carry everything with us from Earth orbit, which is very expensive. So those were short trips. Now we want to have a sustainable presence. Eventually, there will be a, a, man, a human tended or a, a human permanently occupied uh, moon base. We're also building, NASA's also building, I should say, the Gateway Mini Lunar Space Station. Right now, there's the International Space Station in low Earth orbit. What NASA and Europe and, and the Canadians and the Japanese want to do is build the Gateway Mini Lunar Outpost. Okay, and that will be in orbit around the moon. And the astronauts on future Artemis missions would dock there and then go down to the surface of the moon. The first one will be a direct descent. So the difference, again, is those were short stays, but we learned so much from Apollo. We learned the origin of the Earth-Moon system. We brought those first samples back. Now we want to go back to, to stay, and we also want to go to Mars because the moon is a proving ground. We cannot go to Mars if we haven't gone back to the moon first because we did it 50 years ago, but now we have to recreate all of that technology. That, that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and it all starts on Monday with this test flight because this really sets everything into motion and makes sure that they hit those goals because I know that the Artemis program has dealt with a number of hiccups, um, including years of delays, over budget as well. Do you sense that NASA is really feeling the pressure here to make sure that things go smoothly for Monday's launch? They're absolutely feeling the pressure and it has to go well. There's really very little margin for error. Just about everything has to go well. Um, you know, 99.9 percent .9 has to go right. They've got to launch. They've got to orbit the moon. They got to go beyond the moon and do one and a half loops. Then they come back, and then they're going to test the Orion heat shield because it's coming back at about 25,000 miles an hour in versus 17,000 miles an hour. So the heat shield has to be beefed up, and they got to recover that Orion capsule. So it's, it's bigger, better, stronger. It's the biggest heat shield that's ever been built uh, by humanity, over 16 feet wide, wider than even the Mars rover heat shield from Perseverance and Curiosity on, on Mars. So anyway, they got to recover the uh, Orion capsule at the end. We've got to get the astronauts home safe. There are mannequins aboard. Mm -hmm. And so, so that all has to be accomplished. It, it has to be. It just cannot fail. There is no room for failure here. So we got to launch, we got to orbit the moon, and we've got to land that capsule and recover it. And they want to reuse some of the components inside the capsule. So we have to prove that capsule is safe for humans. They'll be doing radiation measurements with those those mannequins, among other things, because mm -hmm. it'll be uh, there's there's very little radiation protection in outer space. So uh, we have to do that. So, you know, they're also launching CubeSats. If the CubeSats fail, that's not a big deal, but they're they're very important for science but not critical to the success of the Artemis program. So pretty much everything has to go right. So there is a lot of pressure. It is years behind schedule and billions over budget, but that's to make sure it works because there's no margin for error here. Now, if this Artemis One mission does run into some problems, what will that mean for the timeline and for the program itself? Kramer, we'll be back with those answers and more right after this. Stay with us. This is the weekly on ClickOrlando.com with Justin Warmith. Welcome back. Five decades after the final flight of NASA's legendary Saturn V moon rocket, the space agency is just one day away from launching its most powerful rocket yet for a consequential and long overdue test flight. The first space launch system, or SLS, is finally ready to blast off from the Kennedy Space Center, sending an unpiloted Orion crew capsule on a 42-day voyage around the moon. Ken Kramer with Space Up Close is back with us to explain why the future of the Artemis program is on the line with tomorrow's launch. I think if it doesn't work out right, depending on what goes wrong, it could end it. I mean, if the, if the rocket were to explode on the launch pad and we didn't get anything done, that would be really bad. Mm -hmm. They've done everything they possibly can do to make sure it works. Now, if in the final moments, uh, Orion, something happens with it at the, at the very end, maybe you could, you could recover from that because they are building new Orion capsules. So, but, but 
the rocket has to work. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, then the question Ken's again becomes, is there political support and is there monetary support in, in the Congress? I know a lot of people like myself would want to continue, but we would have to analyze, you know, what exactly went wrong. Um, if most of it works and at the very end, just something minor goes wrong, not a big deal. But if something major goes wrong, then it would call into question the program. SpaceX has a competing program with their Starship. And that's actually what we need. We need the Starship from SpaceX. That's the human lander. Mm -hmm. So that still has to be built, too. So that's also got to get proven out uh, beyond what anything happens with with this Artemis program. NASA needs the SpaceX Starship to land on the moon because it'll carry the, the lunar lander. So they're more of a partnership than competition? They are an absolute partner. This is not competition. Now, Elon Musk has his own plans to set people to Earth orbit. You know, he's also already launching the Dragon capsule and they're launching Astronaut City International Space on the space Station. And they have private missions like Inspiration 4 and later this year, Polaris Dawn will launch towards the end of this year. So SpaceX is uh, both a competitor and uh, an integral partner. As far as Artemis goes, they're definitely a partner. Mm -hmm. So we need uh, the NASA system work. And then on Artemis 3, we need the SpaceX system to work. And SpaceX is also involved in that they are going to launch some of the elements of the Gateway Mini Space Station. The first elements are launching on a Falcon Heavy, uh, also hopefully around 2024. And then more components after that on various uh, private rocket from SpaceX and ULA. I want to talk about SLS and its sheer power, uh, the most powerful rocket NASA has. I, what do you expect to happen here? Is this going to, do you feel like this is going to feel more and maybe look more, sound more like a space shuttle launch as opposed to what we've been seeing over the last decade or so with these rockets? Absolutely. This is the most powerful rocket in the world ever launched. It's the most powerful NASA has built. And it is the most powerful rocket to this date. The Starship eventually will be more powerful, but NASA is also going to upgrade the space launch system in the future. So it'll have even more thrust. But yeah, it's about 15 to 20 percent more powerful than Apollo and the space shuttle. So it's that class of vehicle. I saw the last bunch of space shuttle launches. I did not see Apollo, but but it's in that class. And that class is like four times the Falcon 9. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's really close to it is the Falcon Heavy. That's about 5.1 million pounds of thrust versus Artemis uh, SLS is about 8.8. .8. So it's about two thirds of a of a of a space shuttle or a or a Artemis that the Falcon Heavy. So that's the only thing that's really close. After that, it's about two and a half million pounds of thrust, the ULA Delta IV Heavy. So, yeah, if you've seen a Falcon Heavy or you've seen a space shuttle many years ago, then you're going to have a, a feeling for what this is like. But it is even more powerful than that. Yeah. And that's like a different feeling, too. It, it is so, a different feeling. Yeah. So it's going to be a lot louder. It's going to be a lot brighter. Mm -hmm. um, and it is just going to be absolutely spectacular. And it's got two giant solid rocket boosters, the most powerful ever built. They are 20% more powerful than the space shuttle. So you're going to see that thing go into space. As solids are just absolute beautiful watching that exhaust trail. So you'll see it going to orbit, you know, unless the clouds intervene. So we should have a, a fantastic show, um, just like the shuttle, just like Apollo, unlike anything. It's unlike anything. So, you know, if you have a chance, you should see it. Now, they are expecting between 100,000 and a million. I've seen various estimates. Mm -hmm probably going to be a half a million. But anyway, if you want to watch that launch, Titusville, where I'm based, is the best place to watch it from. You get a direct view of the launch pad. I just watched it this morning, uh, sunrise. Finally, there weren't clouds at the horizon. I'll be posting those pictures shortly. Mm -hmm. And I'll be at the launch pad, actually, this afternoon, setting my cameras just a few hundred feet away from the rocket. So yeah, and, and the size, too, is massive. It is 322 feet, so about 32 stories Apollo was about 36. The shuttle was about 186 feet. So it was about 18 or 19 stories. So it's really huge. It's more powerful and it's taller than anything that has launched, uh, you know, in many decades. In 50 years, we haven't launched a, an Apollo Saturn V. So it's more powerful and it's taller and it's going further than any human rated spacecraft ever has before. It's going 40,000 miles beyond the moon. 
which is much farther than Apollo. And again, it all leads up to going to Mars. That's what this is all about. The moon is a proving ground. And then the eventual goal is to get to Mars, which we could have done if we hadn't canceled the politicians, I should say. If they hadn't canceled Apollo, we would have been at the moon already. I'll tell you what, uh, you mentioned, you, you brought up Titusville being, your, you think, the best spot to watch a launch. Is that Space View Park? Is that, is that where you would send folks uh, to watch this historic launch? You can watch anywhere on, on Route 1 in Titusville. Space View Park is one of them. There'll be a lot of people on the bridge like there were for the shuttle. There's many parks along Route 1 in Titusville that are, that are with no trees in front that you can watch. They're about 11, 12, 13 miles away at that, that various spot. So not just Space View Park. That's one spot. And that's one little spot. A yeah. million people or 100,000 people cannot fit there. A lot of more people will fit on that bridge. But yeah, so you look on the map, Titusville is a couple of miles long, north to south, anywhere along there. I believe you can also watch along Route 528 uh, where the bridge is. They're going to allow some public viewing. If you don't get too close to the base, you'll still be able to see the rocket on the pad. And that's why Titusville is so good. Before the launch, you can see the rocket sitting there on the pad. And overnight, it'll be illuminated. And you're going to have to get there early. Even the media, like me and your colleagues, we have to get there six hours ahead of time. There's going to be massive traffic jams. So Titusville is the best spot, 528. I wouldn't send people to Jetty Park, although there will be a lot of people there. I know you guys cover a lot of launches from there. But the problem with that is you don't see the rocket till it clears the trees and the buildings. So you only see it afterwards. Now, you really want to see ignition. That's, you know, the exciting part, because then you know when it's happening. When you're, um, when you're at Jetty Park and, and, and Port Canaveral and those beaches, you, you don't see it until it clears the, the tree. So you don't know when it actually launched. You can listen on a radio or a broadcast, but you don't know when it goes. So Titusville, number one spot. And because of that, yeah, they're going to be crowds beyond belief there. And they're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, law enforcement watching and a lot of crowd control. And that's absolutely necessary because cars do pretty cars do travel pretty quickly along Route 1. Again, I was just there this morning and they were moving quick, but they're going to have to move slow and get there early. That is the key. Get there early, bring some food, bring some snacks with you. You're going to be there for like a third of a day. Mm -hmm. And then when it's done, there'll be a massive traffic jam to leave. So you need to have food before you get there, while you're there, and afterwards. And News 6 will have live team coverage of tomorrow's historic test flight, which is set for 8.33 a.m. You can read more about the Artemis program and the timeline for future missions with astronauts on board right now on clickorlando.com space. I'm Justin Mormuth. Hope you have a great Sunday.